Okay, it's fabulous and fantastic being here today and looking at a really nice, diverse group of people that have come together. I think every aspect of diversity, every strand I can see here. So absolutely thrilled and, you know, let me begin by saying how awesome it is to partner with SP Jane in bringing together this particular event to you, unstereotype. I think there's nobody in this world who hasn't had an experience of being stereotyped or hasn't stereotyped someone else. We all are bias carriers. We all are bias recipients. So this thing of bias is so strong in us that it was one of the first instincts of self-protection that was taught to us. Yes, we inherit biases from people really close to us. We inherit biases from our parents. We inherit biases from our teachers. We inherit biases from our mentors. We inherit these biases because that's the way we were taught we would be safe. Because anything different from us is not supposed to be safe for us. That's the way our neurons are wired. We are supposed to keep away from things that are different because they could be harmful for us. And that's how biases began, as a self-protection mechanism, as something that helps us to survive and to stay alive. Now, that was perfectly OK when you're a caveman or a cave woman who's having to use these uh, fight or flight instincts to ward off danger that comes at some unpredictable corner where you're, you know, holding your children and you're trying to keep them safe. But in today's workplace, if those same self-protective instincts were to come, then what kind of a workplace are we creating? Are we creating a workplace that's meant to look at men as the folks that own the workplace while women are the sort of, you know, foreigners, the unwanted aliens who have entered into the workplace? Now, in my case, things kind of sort of followed this pattern. A couple of decades ago, and I'm going to keep that necessarily vague, I took a break in career for all the usual reasons. I mean, they call it the three M, right? Marriage, maternity, mobility. You kind of fall into one of these three categories and you take that break, inevitable break. And then when you have taken that break, what typically happens is you undergo that big moment of wondering what happened to your identity. Am I right? So we then start cross-questioning the reason we took the break. We feel guilty because we took the break, although guilt was the reason why you took the break. You then begin questioning everything around who you are. Are you Mrs. Someone or are you missing someone, which is you? Your own identity of who you are as an individual. And this, all of this happened to me. And one day I just, you know, after a good three years of break, I just wrote up my resume, and then I decided I'm going to go and attend an interview. These were those hazy, glorious days of, you know, when uh, the entire liberalization, privatization, globalization, the original LPG, not the one that we keep seeing all around. You know, that happened. And there was this organization, a telecom company that was setting up shop, <coughs> and I went there, and my previous assignment in a bank in sales, marketing, and ops was a pretty solid reason for why I should apply for the job. But when he looked at my profile, you know what he did? He picked up the phone, a rotary phone, not the mobile phone, because mobile phones weren't there yet. And he called the recruiter who had sent me. And he blasted her. And he said, I asked you for some good, regular candidates. And you're sending me someone with a three-year break? How do you expect she'll do the job? So the recruiter on the other end of the phone tried to convince him to tell him that, you know what, this girl is good. She had a very good track record in her previous 
job and yes, she has taken that three year break, but you know what, you should give her a try. So very grudgingly, the interviewer interviewed me, found me suitable, had to change his mind, wanted to make me an offer, but then he remembered the biases which were there. So he told me whether I'd be ready to take a 40% pay cut in order to get back into the workplace, kind of money that I was making three years even before my break. So the story goes that that was the moment when I felt this deep sense of anger, energy, whatever you call it, which then sort of galvanized into creating this organization called Avatar, which today, ladies and gentlemen, has placed more than 35,000 Soundaryas into the workplace. <laughs> we just decided at that point of time that that talent pool was too good to be just ignored. So when we actually heard about this program for second career women that SP Jain does, we were like wondering, where were you guys when I took that break? <laughs> where were you? I would have just come here and spent those three years, you know, finished my program, got into a great job. So my first point to each one of you here is congratulations. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> the fact that you took that challenge and you said that you want to come back into circulation and have some conversations other than the baby talk. <laughs> have some conversations other than what your mother or your mother-in-law have to tell you about how you have to raise a kid. Mind you, it was very difficult for me. When I had the first conversation with my mother on whether I could, you know, put my son in a daycare center, I could feel chill ice coming from the other side of the phone. She had stopped talking for some time. And then she told me in words which were filled with angst, did I raise you to be this kind of a mother? The fact was that at that point of time, putting your kid in a daycare meant you were actually sending him to an orphanage. That's the kind of thought that was there. Today, whenever any mother, whether she's working or not, thinks of putting her kid in a daycare, I tell her, you know what, this is the best thing you could do. Don't ever pretend that you are going to be the only one that can shape your child's mind. There are folks who are trained to do that for you and please leverage them. So that's, that's the way it is today. So if you have taken that decision to come back into circulation and to do which you want to do to prove your identity, then kudos to you. So happy to see all of you here. The thing about dealing with stereotypes, and I think that is something we all need to learn, is not only recognizing it in ourselves, but also recognizing it outside of ourselves. And mind you, even though we all have taken that proverbial break in career, and we are now planning to get back into circulation into the workplace, we are still going to be dealing with a lot of those biases and stereotypes. So how do you unstereotype your environment? That is what I thought I would share with you in the next few minutes today. So the, the key to this is very simple. Just have this acronym in mind, E-PATH, E-P-A-T-H. This is what I want you to bear in mind as you step into the workplace, as you step into all your workplaces, and you need to recognize biases outside of yourself. You know the thing about recognizing bias within you? That's actually a simpler part. It means that you become self-aware and you are aware of the fact that there are scales which need to be removed from your eyes, and you begin the process of de-biasing yourself. De-biasing yourself is very simple. You need to learn and read more about people who are very different from you. You need to understand what it means to live in their shoes, walk a mile in their shoes, before you realize what it is to actually belong to that community, to that entity, that environment. So de-biasing essentially means you become self-aware, you learn, and you also understand what it means to live the life of another person. So that then helps you build inclusion and removes biases. 
But it's not so easy when you see a bias in another person. When you are the recipient of that bias, when you find discrimination happening, and as Professor Ashita so wonderfully said in her address, if you are seeing that triangulation of stereotyping, discrimination, prejudices, what do you do? And here's where E-PATH comes in. E, your environment. There was once a lady who came to us, to Avatar, saying that, you know, I'm finding it extremely difficult to work in this particular, uh, you know, organization, finding it very difficult because people are constantly, you know, there's a, there's a, my supervisor particularly, he is a very tough person, I don't know what to do. Now, the first thing we ask such women who are poised, you know, to take a break just because the organization seems to be having a lot of bias is this. Is that something only one individual or one entity has, or is it a phenomenon that spread across the workplace? So the E belongs to environment. Is the entire environment infested with bias, or is it only one individual, maybe your supervisor or manager or someone that you work with? If it is only one individual, there is still hope. That means that you can reach out to people and today organizations are doing amazing things to ensure that inclusion becomes the norm. At the Working Mother and Avatar, best 100 companies for women in India, we have organizations, many of whom are represented here and who have accepted our invitation to be here. They actually have many, many different ways in which you can point out biases in an individual, and you can do so without fear or favor, right? But if you find that that bias is deeply seeped in across the environment, then it's time for you to leave that environment. So the first E in terms of de-biasing your environment or de-biasing, uh, you know, others is figure out whether that bias is sort of, you know, related only to one individual or if it is something that's spread across the organization. It would be very easy for you to figure out if the organization is filled with bias and stereotypes because you will find very uncomfortable jokes, off-color poor jokes which people, you know, share with each other. A majority, which is in, in many organizations, it's men, they share very gender and sexist jokes and you will find people being referred to on account of their gender or their identity, and you know that that organization is filled with bias. So environment, E, if it means that it's only one individual, you can still correct it, there is still hope. If it's the entire organization, then I think you have to leave. Remaining, P, A, T, H, P. Once uh, we had a problem from a corporate, where the corporate reached out to us and said, we have these sessions, you know, diversity and inclusion sessions that happen, gender sensitization sessions that happen. But what typically happens is that after that, the organization is kind of, you know, there is, there is too much of, uh, of, of a rough environment. People are, a lot of things have come out which we can't really put at ease. So what do we do? So the answer to that, and very simply, the answer, whenever you're going to confront somebody or someone about their bias is to prepare. The first P stands for preparation. When you wish to unstereotype your environment, when you wish to de-bias an individual who has some kind of a bias which you feel is against you or against some other people, prepare. Actually sit and prepare a conversation. Roll it out in your mind. What would it be if I were to say this? And how would the other person respond? What would I say to that? How would we finish our conversation? Play it out in your mind. Prepare. Because when you prepare, you're not going in with a sense of emotion. You're not jumping in in the heat of the moment. You don't believe yourselves to be some kind of a messiah who's come to correct things. You're looking at it from a point where you have unemotionally distanced yourself, you've given rational thought, 
and you're going in prepared. So the first P of, you know, EPAC P is preparation. And then A, awareness. Whenever we accuse someone of being biased, and you know, all of us do this because we are in an environment which is so different, which has so much of diversity, which has so many different types of identities within it. So how do you ensure that you stay aware? Awareness comes when you understand what that individual has thought which has made him or her biased. Very simple, if you are aware of that individual's background and you know that these are the reasons why that individual is biased, then ensuring that there is not much of opportunity given for that individual to exhibit those biases becomes a good solution. So E, environment, P, preparation, A, awareness, T, T stands for tact. A lot of times when we deal with bias, and especially those of us who are in the diversity and inclusion space, we kind of sort of believe that, you know, we know what we are talking about. We are in this space, we have learnt about it, we have read about it, we have written papers about it, we know what biases are all about. So we believe that we know what we are talking about, it comes through rather forcefully. And when you are dealing with biases and it comes forcefully and aggressively, it actually does the opposite effect of the whole thing. Instead of sorting out a bias, instead of de-biasing that environment, it ends up in cultivating an even deeper bias in the mind of the other individual. So tact becomes key. Again, in order to say what you have to say with tact, so that you do not already burn bridges, which are kind of creaky as it is, you need to prepare, going back to the first point. So if you are able to put across what you wish to say in a manner that is not offensive, that is not hurtful, at the same time conveys what you have to tell the other individual about their biases, then you have it great. The last H stands for hostility. How do you handle hostility? Even if you have done all of this, E for environment, studying the environment, P for preparation, being prepared, A for awareness, becoming aware and T using tact. Fact is that when you have such kind of a conversation, it does become hostile. So in order to avoid that hostility, it is definitely better to see in a workplace and definitely in institutions whether there is a way in which this can be rooted either through a mentor or a sponsor of yours. So is that a better way to handle this? Can the hostility be removed that way? Or if in case you've had that conversation and you seem to find that there is a bit of hostility, how do you diffuse that situation? So becoming aware of the effect of this conversation which could lead to a hostile situation is another aspect which we need to keep in mind while we unstereotype. Dear ladies and gentlemen, when we speak about a world where every single individual obtains the opportunity to rise to the fullest of their potential, that absolutely definitely means a world where there are no biases. Only in a world that has been completely de-biased do you have opportunities for all of us, whatever be our gender, whatever be our sexual orientation, whatever be our ability, whatever be the way in which our cognitive thinking actually happens. Metacognition these days they call it. You know how all of us think about things, how we think about thinking. In all of these ways we may be different, but if biases are removed from our workplaces, from our institutions, from our very minds, then irrespective of whatever background, whatever identity we come from, we each have the opportunity to rise to the fullest of our potential. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I once again thank each one of you for having taken out the time to come here and be with us as we go through today, this evening's journey of listening to some fabulous people and their unstereotyped stories. Thank you once again and have a great evening.